Imagine in 1972 what was happening. Uh, you had bombs still falling in Vietnam. You had the first inkling of the Watergate scandal surfacing in, in the Washington Post. He gave Americans a reason to cheer about something and, and thump their chests again. In his home city of New York, Fisher was getting more attention than the beloved Yankees. New York Post took a poll in different taverns around the, the boroughs of New York, and invariably, everyone in all those working-class bars around New York were tuned into the PBS show watching Bobby's moves being relayed. Even with several matches remaining, Fisher's two-point lead seemed insurmountable. As the match started to go badly, you could see Spassky... You could feel Spassky getting nervous and making moves that were not characteristic because he was a very great player. Spassky was clearly extremely shaken. He wasn't eating properly, he wasn't sleeping properly, and he made three or four quite bad blunders in that first half of the match. I think Spassky realized that he was going to lose the match. With their champ on the ropes, the Soviet squad resorted to desperate measures. The Soviets issued a press release, and in that press release, they charged that Bobby Fischer was using nine chess means to influence the outcome of the match. Boris was normally a very, very solid, straightforward, very pleasant man. Announced that he believed that his chair and perhaps the lighting fixture over the table had been manipulated by the Americans. The accusations sound absurd today, but in the climate of Cold War brinkmanship, match officials weren't taking any chances. And they ended up conducting three tests to determine if they thought Bobby was cheating. They conducted a lighting test, and they conducted an x-ray test, and a chemical test where they analyzed all the micro impurities on Spassky's chair and Fisher's chair, and it turned out there was nothing. With the manipulation charges dismissed, Fisher returned his focus to the match. In the 21st game, Fisher mobilized his bishops and lured Spassky into sacrificing his rook. The game adjourned that evening with Fisher commanding a superior position. We were leaving to um, anal analyze the game. And, and Fisher said, no, 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 let's go bowling. So they went bowling. Everybody's trying to figure out what the next moves are. All the top players in the world except for one, Bobby Fisher. And when the match resumed the next morning, it was Boris Spassky who failed to turn up. The phone rang, and I picked it up. It was Boris Spassky who said, I can't win this one, and resigned. And uh, Father Lombardi and I ran around the room screaming for about 10 minutes, and then ran down the hall to Bobby's suite. Congratulations to the world champion. Boris has resigned. And he looked at me and said, get it in writing. In a real fight, all the other players I played, they crumbled at a certain stage, and I never felt that, you know, fasting. On the 1st of September 1972, Bobby Fischer was crowned king of the chess world. Bobby didn't just beat Boris Spassky that day. He beat 36 other grandmasters in Russia who were burning up the phone lines between Rechevik and Moscow. It was just Bobby alone against them. You can't overstate how important that was. That's something very rare that somebody can come alone without the support of a whole regime like Boris Spassky had back in the Soviet Union, all the support of the other grandmasters and the whole system behind him. For a country that took pride in using chess as a propaganda tool, to lose the world title to a skinny kid from Brooklyn was unthinkable. The Soviet Union had lost the World Chess Championship. They had held without interruption. Since 1948, they had lost the championship that had said to the world, the Soviet system works, its values are proclaimed through the chessboard. Fischer's status as a hero, however, would be fleeting. When it was time to defend his world championship in 1975 against Soviet newcomer Anatoly Karpov, Fischer again refused to play, even with a huge purse of five million dollars. He said that he would not play. Uh, even if one point of his demands would not be met. And in turn, Bobby Fischer turned his back on the world championship once and for all. Bobby Fischer was a hero in 1972, a symbol of American dominance in the Cold War. 
Upon his return to the States, Fisher, now a national sensation, appeared with the likes of Dinah Shaw and Bob Hope. But despite his celebrity status, Bobby had grown even more reclusive and reluctant to play competitive chess. And everybody thought we were in for an era of Fisher dominance. When Fisher refused to defend his title in 1975, Anatoly Karpov captured the world championship. The Soviets reclaimed the championship. Bobby Fischer said he was going to be one of the most active players, uh, world champions in history, when in fact he never played a single official game of chess after the last game of that 1972 match. To the astonishment of the chess world, Bobby Fischer vanished. He became completely reclusive. Sightings of him became a bit like sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. They weren't necessarily reliable, but they were quite frequent. But even in his absence, many chess fans considered Fischer the true champion. Whenever a chess tournament was being played, no matter where it was, Bobby was conspicuous by his absence, and he was the ghost hovering over the banquet, if you will. I mean, everyone knew he was still the strongest chess player in the world. Without chess, Fischer had nothing. No education, no social network, and no means of financial support. For a time, it was believed Bobby lived on the streets of Los Angeles. Finally, in 1981, Fisher surfaced in Pasadena. Bobby was arrested in Pasadena, and he happened to, to bear uh, a passing resemblance to a bank robber who they, they had an all-points bulletin out for at the time. And Bobby being Bobby refused to uh, tell the police who he was. And as you can imagine, police in Southern California don't keep up with the chess scene and they didn't recognize Bobby. And they took him into uh, custody for 48 hours. And the upshot of that was a cult classic in the chess world known as I was tortured in a Pasadena jailhouse. According to Fisher, he was choked, stripped and left to shiver in a cold cell. There were other, more disturbing incidents, too. Incidents that indicated Fisher, born and raised in a Jewish family, had turned on his heritage. He'd go around in California and put this anti-Semitic literature on the back of cars. He was searching for something, I don't know what. He was brought up in the Italian section of Brooklyn, where they would call him all kinds of anti-Semitic names, you know? I don't know what triggered it in his brain. She has made some very, very inappropriate comments in regards to various ethnic groups. And unfortunately, the inappropriate comments are really a strong reflection of his Asperger's syndrome. Whatever the cause, by 1982, Fischer had once again disappeared. Rumors cited him everywhere from Germany to Japan. Obviously, anybody who's an artist and doesn't perform for 20 years, to me, that's tragic. He was the height of his game. He could have produced many more brilliant games. Then, in 1992, against the backdrop of brutal combat and ethnic cleansing, a Yugoslavian banker offered to stage a lucrative 20th anniversary rematch of the Spassky Fischer World Championship. A $5 million purse, more than $3 million for the winner, was enough to draw Fisher out of hiding. Bobby decided to do the rematch in 92 because he really had no other choice as far as options in his life. He was essentially broke, destitute, homeless, and uh, he needed money. Unfortunately for Fisher, as an American citizen, the Yugoslav prize money was off limits. There were UN sanctions on Yugoslavia because Yugoslavia was in the middle of its civil war. And there was a presidential executive order banning Americans from any commercial exchanges with Yugoslavia. If he was going to disregard it, the most appropriate thing would be just to disregard it and play. But Bobby had to do something very inappropriate, which was that he took the, the order, appeared in front of the, the news media, said, this is what I think of this order, and spit on it 